I've been wanting to make this video for a while now, and I'm glad to finally get the opportunity to get around to it. It is about the 2022 Jehovah's Witness Memorial. I did watch it on Zoom again this year, and again, I found it both boring and disturbing. One of the things that I wanted to focus in on today was the songs that they sing. They're just so sad. There's no hope there. And watching them all standing there faithfully singing their songs was just, it was just so sad. So I thought, let's go through it because that same weekend, we were taking the Lord's Supper on Sunday, as we do monthly, as I'm sure many of you Christians do as well. And in comparison, we sing a communion song before we take the bread and the wine. And that song is just, it's so joyful and wonderful. And it just makes your heart so glad, you know, and it's beautiful and it's deep and it's well written and it's a beautiful tune. It's just, it's just amazing to get to sing it. And it just, I don't want to do a we're better than you kind of thing. That's not what I'm trying to do here. It just was such a, a vast difference between what we were doing on Sunday morning and what they were doing at their memorial. So I've got the songs here. Let's compare the words and let's see what they actually sing in these songs. As I said, this is so disturbing to me, especially the first one, my goodness. So the first song is called A Special Possession, and it's song number 25. The first verse says, God has a new creation, his spirit anointed sons. He has bought them from mankind, his approval they've won. So who are we talking about here? If you understand a bit about Jehovah's Witness teachings, when they say spirit-anointed sons, what they mean is the literal 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses, most of whom are dead, and probably the vast majority of current witnesses would say that they don't actually know any of the 144,000 because they've all died. Or they know someone who claims to be one of the 144,000, but they've been taught by the organization to quietly suspect that that person probably has some kind of mental disease and probably isn't really one of the 144,000. So what that would have to do in the Jehovah's Witnesses mind is get them always questioning if they know of anyone who would claim to have that special anointing except for those eight men in New York who call themselves the governing body. They're generally pretty confident that those ones are not mentally diseased and are actually part of the 144,000 and that they are spirit anointed and they're Jehovah's mouthpiece and channel of communication on earth and basically other words for prophet. So someone has written a song, I'm sure somewhere high up in the organization, to praise those eight men in New York, basically. That's what the song is doing. It's about singing how happy we are about them, about all that they get. They've been bought from mankind. But then also look at that last line, his approval they've won. What does that even mean? They've done the right works, they've done enough works, and how do you know they've done those works? How do you know that they're not mentally diseased too? Because of all the stuff they say, because they claim to be the fulfillment of all these various scriptures? That's an awful lot of faith to be put in these imperfect men, isn't it? Now the chorus. A special possession they're a people for your name. They love you. They praise you. As one, they declare abroad your fame. You know, so generally I could look at that and say, hey, that's, that's a reasonable description of actual Christians who have been, by the grace of God, brought into the family of God. What's striking to me, too, is looking at this chorus, they're singing about people who love Jehovah. They're not saying... Jehovah, we love you. They're saying, look at those people over there. They love Jehovah. They praise Jehovah. Can you imagine a Christian song sounding like that? I mean, maybe there are some out there somewhere. I don't know. I sure hope not. That's, that's just terrible. Okay, verse 2. They are a holy nation who handle the truth aright. God has called them from darkness to his wonderful light. 
So let's look at that line by line. They are a holy nation, not the rank and file Jehovah's Witness, just these literal 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses, most of whom are dead but might be mentally diseased and are probably really just the eight men in New York. They're the holy nation. And the great crowd, the rank and file Jehovah's Witness, actually just believes that they get some kind of extended benefits, which is nowhere in scripture, really. It just breaks my heart that people are singing this stuff and they're so happy and excited about it. This is all part of the brainwashing. Next, God has called them from darkness to his wonderful light. So not the rank and file, just the 144,000, or by extension, somehow the rank and file, I don't know. I mean, certainly that line would apply to Christians, for sure. We have been called out of darkness to his wonderful light. Absolutely, that's a great thing. And we could certainly sing about that in hymns and Christian songs, but... Again, they're they're singing this about the governing body, essentially, and sort of also maybe some of the people who claim to be the 144,000. That's so muddy that I'm sure the cognitive dissonance must really kick in there and they just try not to think about it. And verse number three, faithful to their commission, they gather the other sheep. So whose job is it to gather the other sheep? Oh, right, it's the governing body's job, okay. Or the 144,000 that nobody knows. To the Lamb they are loyal, his commandments they keep. So, and again, this is singing praises to essentially the eight men in New York, or sort of maybe muddy way, sort of by extension, the other 144,000 who are still around. They're the ones who are loyal to the Lamb, and they're fulfilling the commandments. They're keeping the commandments. Are they? Which ones? And how well are they keeping them? Because I know for me, as a Christian who has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and is being sanctified, I still don't keep the commandments perfectly because I am still human. I am still a sinner in the flesh. And that will be the case until the day when I am glorified and I'm made like Christ and I'm in his presence because I have that that hope, that promise that the Jehovah's Witnesses are told they cannot have. Now, you may notice that there are some proof texts here listed underneath the title and also at the bottom of the page. I was going to go through those verses, but ultimately it's just such a waste of time, I think, because they're just so cut out of context that they have really nothing at all to do with the song. And my guess is that most Jehovah's Witnesses don't ever look up those verses, and it really wouldn't accomplish anything other than to be the usual thing that they do, which is randomly choose things to make it sound like they know what they're talking about. So I'm going to skip those and let's move on to song number two. So this one is song number 18 and it's called Grateful for the Ransom. Verse one. Today, Jehovah God, we stand before your throne. Well, this kind of sounds like a good start, but how can they be standing before his throne when they're the great crowd and they're supposed to be only on earth? So there's a bit of a problem there. I mean, for a Christian song, that's actually okay, you know, for a good start. But but really, do they think they stand before the throne? I know they have this sort of like deflection they do or this way to, to squeeze around it by saying, oh, well, the earth is his footstool, so the earth is kind of before the throne. But that's actually not the wording in scripture when you talk about the great crowd before the throne in Revelation. Anyway. For you showed the greatest love that could ever be shown. Yep, I agree with that. That's very true. You gave the gift of your son that we might live. No greater sacrifice than this could you ever give. Okay, yeah, I totally agree with that. It's a bit of a weak writing, you know. It's it's, it's kind of not terribly creative, you know. It's not beautiful and it, it, they haven't put a whole lot of thought. It's just like, let's just make sure it rhymes, right? But that aside... Okay, as a Christian, I could totally agree with that about Jesus. Sure. The problem being context, of course, because they mean something different than what the Bible means. And that's that's the scary thing here that they're singing. So the chorus. He gave his life to set us free. His precious blood provides the key. With all our hearts, we'll go on thanking you eternally. You know, overall, I, I could absolutely agree with it as a Christian, But there are some issues here that I can see just looking at it through the lens of the watchtower. So what does it mean to be set free? Free from what? Because not free from sin, because even in paradise earth, apparently people will still be allowed to sin or able to sin because that's the almighty free will right there. So you can't have free will without sin. 
and his precious blood provides the key. What key is that? That's like not really a biblical term that I know of. And I think that was really put in there because they needed something to rhyme with eternally. Also, what does it mean by his blood? They the way that they apply the blood of Christ, it just does not fit scripturally. And it doesn't apply to them. It's not a key for them because they believe that his blood was shed to, for the covenant with the literal 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses who are mostly no longer here or are mentally diseased. And so let's just assume that only applies to the governing body. So we still got a problem here from their perspective. So with all our hearts, we'll go on thanking you eternally, but wait a minute, you can still die in paradise earth. How do you know that you'll be thanking God eternally? I'm wondering about this because I am not an ex-Jehovah's Witness, so I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments about this. Would a line like that be something that feeds the idea that you are going to survive Armageddon, you're never going to die, so that way you can keep on thanking God eternally? Because... Otherwise, if you die, you cease to exist, and then there's a copy of you made from Jehovah's memory on the new earth, right? So that line wouldn't really apply if you thought about it, because they're going to die, and they're not going to go on thanking God eternally. And even they don't think that if they die, they will be able to do that. They just believe there will be a new version of them made from Jehovah's memory, which is not in the Bible again, but that's what they've been taught, so that's what they believe. It was a willing sacrifice that Jesus made. Out of love, his perfect life was the price that he paid. Yep, I agree with that. We had no hope until he came to save mankind. First of all, who is we? Second of all, what about the hope that Jehovah provided in Genesis 3? That the people of God all throughout the Old Testament, which they call the Hebrew Scriptures, held on to. They had hope. So this idea of no hope until he came, that just does not fit. And what a sad thing. What a really sad thing. And I guess maybe that's tied into their idea that none of the people in the Old Testament will ever go to heaven. I don't know. That it's. I'm, I'm not sure. Again, if you're an XJW, please feel free to comment on that because I'd love to know more about what the mindset would be of a Jehovah's Witness while he or she is singing this song. But now our hope is finding life, leaving death behind. Again, this does not fit with their ideology because they're not leaving death behind. They're going to die and cease to exist according to their teachings unless they survive Armageddon. And then you can still die on Paradise Earth too. I don't know. Nobody seems to know or be able to explain what exactly the protocol is with that. But yeah, it's possible still. And again, there's some little proof text that they add in that I'm not going to worry about because, you know, you know the drill. Now let's look at the song that we sing in our church before we take communion. And you know, there are a lot of great hymns and songs that you can sing before communion, but I just wanted to share this one because it just was such a contrast for me compared to what I had just witnessed at that Zoom meeting of the 2022 JW Memorial. So this song is by Stuart Townend and Keith and Kristen Getty. And it's called, Behold the Lamb Who Bears Our Sins Away. And I'm going to play a little bit of it at the end here. It's right, This is their website, and I want to just play a little bit, because it's such a pretty song. But I don't want to break any copyright or anything, so I'm just going to play a little, and there's a link that I'm going to provide for you, and you can actually see it on YouTube. It's just a pretty song, So and it's performed by Stuart Townend. Behold the Lamb Who Bears Our Sins Away slain for us and we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross so we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the king the body of our savior jesus christ torn for you eat and remember the wounds that heal, the death that brings us life, paid the price to make us one. So we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of love around the table of the King. The blood that cleanses every stain of sin shed for you, 
drink and remember. He drained death's cup that all may enter in to receive the life of God. So we share in this bread of life, and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of grace around the table of the King. And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth. As we share in his suffering, we proclaim Christ will come again and will join in the feast of heaven around the table of the King. Savior Jesus 